Welcome to About Scripture, a podcast designed to take the listener deeper into Scripture and biblical thought. I'm Ed Gallagher, Professor of Christian Scripture at Heritage Christian University. I hope to cover a variety of topics with you about Scripture. This podcast is brought to you in partnership with Heritage Christian University, where we help students to thrive in ministry. To find out more, go to hcu.edu. We're also partnering with the Ministry League Network. They have free resources to help the local church all over the world. Download the app in the iOS or Play Store, or check out the website at ministryleague.com. And now, welcome to the podcast. Well, it's time to start digging into the weeds. And if you thought we were already in the weeds, you haven't seen anything yet. Today, we are going to talk about the word Elohim. And this is going to enter into the sort of the Mike Heiser portion of our study of angels. If you're familiar with Mike Heiser's uh, book, The Unseen Realm, uh, this is going to have some parallels to that book. If you're not familiar with it, you might want to get familiar with that book. It it is certainly making the rounds um, of our churches. I've received several questions about it. It's, It's about supernatural beings. Hebrews chapter 2 quotes Psalm 8. This is the New American Standard. This is Hebrews 2, 6 and 7. What is man that you remember him, or the son of man that you are concerned about him? You have made him for a little while lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor. That's a quotation of Psalm 8, verses 4 and 5. Now let me read those verses from the Old Testament book of Psalms in also the New American Standard. What is man that you take thought of him, and the son of man that you care for him? Yet you have made him a little lower than God, and you crown him with glory and majesty. The writer of Hebrews quotes Psalm 8, where the psalmist had marveled at the lofty position God had granted humans. According to the quotation in Hebrews, God has made humans, quote, lower than the angels. The epistle to the Hebrews is written in the Greek language, as is the entire New Testament, and so it quotes the Greek translation, the Septuagint of the Psalms, which uses the word angels at Psalm 8, 5. But the Hebrew text of the Psalms uses the word Elohim, which we usually translate God, capital G, or God, lowercase g. That's why the New American Standard translates the Hebrew text of Psalm 8, 5 you have made him a little lower than God, a little lower than Elohim. In other words, the Hebrew text of Psalm 8.5 says that humans are a little lower than Elohim. And when this verse was translated into Greek, the Greek translator said that humans were a little lower than angeloi. And it is this Greek translation that the author of Hebrews quoted at Hebrews 2, 7. Does that mean that the Septuagint mistranslated the Hebrew text? Should he have put theos, God, rather than angelos, angel? And did Hebrews quote a mistranslation? No, I don't think that's the best way to understand what's happening in these texts. This example helps us to see that the Hebrew word Elohim does not always mean God, certainly not God with a capital G. 
We usually translate the word as God, as in Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, Elohim created the heavens and the earth. God created the heavens and the earth. But Elohim can mean other things as well. In English, we use the term God, with a lowercase g, to refer to false gods, not just the one God of heaven and earth. In Hebrew, it is the same. Elohim can mean God, capital G, or gods, lowercase g. We distinguish God, capital, from God's lowercase by capitalization, but Hebrew has no such thing as capital letters. So the word Elohim looks the same either way. Let's think for a moment what we mean by gods, lowercase g. Of course, we probably don't believe that these other gods exist, but we frequently use the term gods when talking about non-Christian religions like the Greco-Roman gods, Zeus and Hera and Apollo, or the ancient Near Eastern gods, Baal and Asherah and Marduk. What do we mean when we use the word gods in this way? In the ancient Greco-Roman mind, or the ancient Near Eastern mind, what distinguished Zeus or Baal from a human being? What made them gods? We can think of a few characteristics that ancient people attributed to these gods. They, the ancient people uh, thought of Zeus and Baal as very powerful, not all powerful, but quite powerful. They did not live on earth, but somewhere in the sky, or at least on a very tall mountain that reaches to the skies, like Mount Olympus or Mount Safon. And they are usually immortal, not subject to death. Those characteristics, again, very powerful, but not all powerful, not terrestrial, but heavenly, they don't live on earth, and immortal. These characteristics apply to anything in the Bible? Certainly. We usually call these things angels. From this perspective, you could call angels a type of God. After all, what distinguishes Zeus from the archangel Michael? Well, Michael doesn't receive worship, and he conducts his affairs under the authority of Yahweh, but other than those two points, they are pretty similar. Very powerful, heavenly, immortal. And in fact, the Hebrew Bible occasionally uses the term Elohim in, in reference to what we would call angels. That is, supernatural beings, more powerful than humans, but less powerful than Yahweh. Apparently, that is the reason the Septuagint translated the word Elohim in Psalm 8.5 as angels. And that's why some modern English translations like the ESV render Elohim in that verse as heavenly beings. The main point right now is that the Hebrew Bible applies the word God, Elohim, sometimes to beings other than Yahweh, the God of heaven and earth. Actually, maybe we shouldn't translate Elohim as God, but rather as supernatural being or something like that. In the beginning, the supernatural being created the heavens and the earth. Not a very attractive translation, but possibly more accurate. We might not like to talk about multiple gods in the Bible, but usually we don't mind thinking about there being multiple supernatural beings in the Bible. From this perspective, Yahweh would be one of the Elohim, in fact, the most powerful, all-powerful, and only eternal Elohim, the one Elohim that created all the other Elohim. Well, let's talk about these Hebrew words, a couple of Hebrew words, Elohim and Elim. These are both words that are usually translated God. All right, first, let's, let's take the second one I just mentioned, which the singular is El, and the plural is Elim. 
This word appears 240 times in the Hebrew Bible and a whole bunch of times outside the Bibles, like over 500 times in the Dead Sea Scrolls, for instance. It can refer to Yahweh, as in the compound term El Shaddai, often translated God Almighty, but El can refer to Yahweh without the addition of Shaddai. El can also refer to pagan gods. Uh, Deuteronomy 32, 12 is an example. In Exodus 34, 14, El appears twice. The, word, the Hebrew word El appears twice in that verse, once in reference to Yahweh, once in reference to other gods. It says, you shall worship no other El, no other God, no other El, because Yahweh is a jealous El, God. The Septuagint usually translates El with Theos, which is the common Greek word for God. But not always. There was also a god named El. So El can be a proper name, not, well, it's debated, but not maybe in the Bible, but outside the Bible, at Ugarit, among the Ugaritic literature, El is actually the name of the, god, of the high god. The chief god is named El. Again, it's just a word that means God. Then there's this other word, more common, Elohim. The sing Elohim is actually a plural. Some of you probably already know that. The singular is Eloah. The singular appears in the Hebrew Bible 57 times, which is not a lot. And the vast majority of those are in the book of Job, which, not surprising, Job's a weird book. And only a handful of times in the Dead Sea Scrolls. So the singular is not common. The plural appears in the Hebrew Bible more than 2,600 times and more than 200 times in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Eloah, the singular, usually refers to Yahweh, but can refer to a pagan god. An instance of a pagan god is uh, Daniel 11.39. Elohim, the plural, also usually refers to Yahweh, even though it is plural in form and Yahweh is singular. This is strange, and I don't have a great explanation for it. Maybe, maybe the word, the plural Elohim refers to the singular Yahweh because Elohim emphasizes the majesty and power of God. That's one explanation uh, from uh, Hebrew grammar. The explanation is probably not that Yahweh is Trinity, because the Israelites probably did not understand this idea, and they are the ones using this language. At any rate, when Elohim refers to Yahweh, it takes a singular verb, which is sort of like saying in English, the deer is eating grass. The fact that the verb used is, is eating, tells you that the word deer, which can be singular or plural, must be singular here. The deer is eating grass. We could also say the deer are eating grass for multiple deer. Back to Hebrew, the verb form tells us that Elohim, even though it looks plural, must be functioning as a singular noun. For instance, in the beginning, Elohim created the heavens and the earth has a grammatically singular Hebrew verb translated created. So we know it's actually grammatically a singular. Just to cover all my bases, let me acknowledge that occasionally a plural verb is used with Elohim, even when the reference is Yahweh. Maybe these plural verbal forms are just instances of mistakes in the transmission of the texts. When Elohim refers to pagan gods, a plural verb should be used, Judges 2.12 is an example of that, showing that the word should be translated gods, but occasionally a singular, singular verb is used, like at Judges 11.24. All right, now, so Elohim. Let's talk about Elohim that are not Yahweh. The, the Bible sometimes uses this word in reference to beings that are not Yahweh. Even though Elohim almost always refers to Yahweh and is translated God, capital G, there are instances in the Bible where Elohim or Elim does not refer to Yahweh. We've seen an instance in which the Septuagint translates Elohim as angels. That's Psalm 8.5. 
So think about these. Psalm 29. Ascribe to Yahweh, O sons of Elim. Ascribe to Yahweh glory and strength. Psalm 89, verses 5 through 7. Let the heavens praise your wonders, O Yahweh, your faithfulness in the assembly of the holy ones. For who in the skies can be compared to Yahweh? Who among the sons of Elim is like Yahweh? An El, a God, greatly to be feared in the council of the holy ones and awesome above all who are around him. Exodus 15, 11, Who is like you among the Elim, O Yahweh? Deuteronomy 3, 24, What El is there in heaven or on the earth who can do according to your works and according to your mighty deeds? 1 Kings 8, 23, O Yahweh, Elohim of Israel, there is no Elohim like you in the heavens above or on the earth beneath. Psalm 95, verse 3, Psalm 97, verse 9, 1 Samuel 28, verse 13. That's the witch of Endor passage where Samuel is called an Elohim. There are more. I would not pretend that the interpretation of these passages is simple or that it's easy to get inside the mind of the biblical author or the ancient Israelites who composed these texts or read them, but at least on the face of it, it seems that the Bible uses the word Elohim and Elim for more beings than just Yahweh. By the way, think about the first commandment in the Ten Commandments, Exodus 20, verse 3, You shall have no other Elohim before me. You shall have no other Elohim before me. Does this verse assume the existence of other Elohim or at least not directly challenge such a belief? Christians have traditionally understood that angels were sometimes called gods or sons of God, as the 4th century Latin writer Jerome said in reference to the fourth person in the fiery furnace. Remember that, Daniel 3? Much later, Milton had God, Milton in Paradise Lost, had God the Father address his heavenly host as gods. Already in the second century AD, Irenaeus felt compelled to issue a caution about such language. Irenaeus, this is against heresies, book three. He says, when, however, scripture calls those gods who really are not, it does not, as I have already noted, present them as gods absolutely, but with certain modification and indication by which they are shown not to be gods. This is still Irenaeus. He says, David proves this at Psalm 96, verse 5, which says, The gods of the nations are idols of the demons. Or Psalm 81, verse 10, You shall not bow down to foreign gods. So Irenaeus is acknowledging, yeah, Scripture sometimes uses the word God for beings uh, other than Yahweh, but they're not really gods. Here, Irenaeus is concerned to argue against Gnostic theology that posited multiple gods as worthy of our attention, as helpful to directing us spiritually. He asserts that these other gods mentioned in the Bible are not really gods. He doesn't actually say what they are. The point is the Gnostics are wrong. There, uh, a, this is a quote from Irenaeus again. There is no other god nor another father. And then he goes on and lists all the designations that Gnostics use to talk about these other gods. And he says, they don't exist either. There, there is none of that. As I've already suggested, we might want to translate Elohim as supernatural being rather than God. The biblical scholar John Levinson suggests we compare the English word spirit. He says that the, the word Elohim functions like the English word spirit, which can denote anything from God with a capital G to an angel or a demon or a ghost, a tone of an organization, or an alcoholic beverage. Now, there are statements in the Bible which seem to deny the existence of other Elohim. Deuteronomy 4, verse 35, Yahweh is the Elohim. There is no other besides him. 
Or Deuteronomy 32, verse 39, there is no Elohim beside me, God says. Despite appearances, these statements probably do not intend to deny the actual existence of other Elohim besides Yahweh. Rather, these statements exalt Yahweh above all other Elohim. In Isaiah 47, verses 8 uh, and 10, in fact, Babylon, the city of Babylon, says something similar to what God says in Deuteronomy 32, 39. So in, in Isaiah 47, verses 8 and 10, Babylon, the city of Babylon, says, there is no one besides me. Probably that kind of claim doesn't really mean that Babylon thought no other city existed, but only that no other city compared favorably to Babylon. Same thing for Nineveh. Nineveh, the city of Nineveh, makes that kind of claim at Zephaniah 2 verse 15. There is no one besides me. Probably just means no other city compares favorably to me. So probably that's the right way to interpret these statements from Yahweh as well in Deuteronomy. The other Elohim, in other words, are not comparable to Yahweh. He alone is God of gods. The other gods, in fact, are Deuteronomy 32, 21, mere breaths or puffs of air. Later, Jewish authors sometimes use this terminology in the same way that we've seen in the Bible. As we saw uh, last time, one interesting text from the Dead Sea Scrolls conceives of Melchizedek as a heavenly being, something like an angel. This exaltation of Melchizedek supplies interesting material for comparison with the appearance of Melchizedek in Hebrews 7. This Dead Sea Scroll interprets Psalm 82 in terms of Melchizedek, so that Melchizedek is called Elohim and passes judgment on other Elohim. In the New Testament, Paul talks about, quote, so-called gods, legomenoi theoi, at 1 Corinthians 8, verses 5 and 6. Paul does not mean to deny the existence of a spiritual reality called gods. He just means to say that they are misnamed. He doesn't mean that there is only one theos, one god, and one kurios in existence, but only one of each that we care about, that are for us. That is, mere existence does not belong to our God and our Lord alone. The reason our God and our Lord are worthy of worship is because they are for us, because of their love for us. Now, is this monotheism? Is the Bible a monotheistic book? This is a big debate in current scholarship. Does the Bible promote monotheism? Is biblical religion monotheistic? It depends on what you mean by monotheism. Let me quote Richard Bauckham. The essential element in what Bauckham has called Jewish monotheism, the element that makes it a kind of monotheism, is not the denial of the existence of other gods, but an understanding of the uniqueness of Yahweh that puts him in a class of his own, a wholly different class from any other heavenly or supernatural beings, even if these are called gods. Bauckham goes on to identify the transcendent uniqueness of Yahweh in the following ways. Yahweh alone is creator of all things, whereas all other things are created by him. Yahweh alone is the sovereign Lord of all things, whereas all other things serve or are subject to his universal lordship. So at the end of the day, it doesn't particularly matter to me and maybe not to you either if we call this monotheism or not. After all, the term monotheism is not a biblical term. It all depends on what we mean by monotheism, but the, the main point when we think about the way the Bible uses words like 
Elohim and the Os, words we usually translate God, is that there are multiple of these beings, but all of them are created except for one. And those that are created give glory and honor to the one that created them. Psalm 148, praise Yahweh, praise Yahweh from the heavens, praise him in the heights, praise him, all his angels, praise him, all his hosts, praise him, sun and moon, praise him, all you shining stars, praise him, you highest heavens and you waters above the heavens, let them praise the name of Yahweh, for he commanded and they were created. Or Deuteronomy 10, verse 17. Yahweh your Elohim is Elohim of Elohim. Usually we would say God of gods. The Lord of lords, the great El, mighty and awesome. All the other Elohim, though they may exist, and the Bible says that they do, they were created by the one Elohim who is the creator of all things, and they all ascribe glory and honor to that one.